Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Monica Young, who's the executive director of the International Myopia Institute, which is the global expert body focused on advancing myopia research, education, and management to prevent future vision impairment and blindness from high myopia related to complications. Dr. Young's research uh, focus around refractive error, understanding myopia risk factors, myopia control, and public health impacts. Dr. Young also is an adjunct professor at the University of Canberra in Australia. She's authored peer-reviewed articles and uh, is just uh, the one of the most well-renowned international experts on myopia. We're pleasured to have her on the Myopia Podcast. Metric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you again for joining us for this episode. As I mentioned, we're here with Dr. Monica Young. Thank you very much for joining us. We're, uh, we're honored that you're, uh, you're joining us from Australia. It's a pleasure to be here. and. It's always wonderful to be able to speak to North Americans. You're all so enthusiastic and passionate about myopia, and my only wish is to just spread the news further. Yeah, well, you're certainly helping us do that. So Monica is the executive director of the National Myopia Institute. And uh, if you're not aware of what that is, it's a, a, a group of, uh, it's a global expert body focused on advancing myopia research. Monica, can you kind of talk with us about the genesis of uh, the IMI and how this all kind of came about. And uh, you've been going for, I believe, six years now. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I can't believe it's been six years. <laughs> well, firstly, I joined, originally, I joined the Brian Holden Vision Institute working for Professor Brian Holden, and he was already working in the area of myopia. So, mm -hmm. His organisation was already doing clinical trials, looking at slowing myopia progression using spectacles and contact lenses at the time. But back then, we're talking about probably a decade ago, you know, myopia management wasn't even a catchphrase at that point. And, it, you know, people were still correcting vision with single vision spectacles. The evidence basically hadn't really gone past the journals or the literature into, you know, day-to-day -day practice. Yeah. And part of the issue was also because, you know, the peak health bodies or governments and policymakers didn't even know that myopia was an issue. It wasn't even on their radar. So in 2015, uh, Professor Holden and myself were able to speak to the health minister in Australia and let him know how serious the health issue of myopia is and that it's an ocular issue and not simply a refractive condition. Right. And so from that meeting, the health minister invited the WHO to a, a meeting on myopia and high myopia held in Sydney. And that's where we had uh, leaders from the WHO from Geneva come to Sydney and we had 34 experts representing every WHO region in the world on myopia yeah. attend. And from that meeting, we published a, a report that finally put myopia and high myopia and pathologic myopia on the agenda. And the report stated that there was evidence to suggest that we could prevent and slow myopia progression. And so that was really a landmark, landmark mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And from that meeting, you know, it could have just been a meeting that went nowhere because you can write a report and have it online. Yeah. And then nobody accesses it. And so from that meeting, it was decided that we need a group to continue on the efforts to keep myopia on the agenda. And that's how the International Myopia Institute was uh, conceived. It was because of the WHO meeting and all the people who were invited from all parts of the world, including North America. We had Professor Earl Smith, who was the Dean at the University of Houston at right. the time. And, and from that meeting, all these passionate people decided, yes, we want to do this, we want to keep myopia on the agenda. And so IMI was conceived and it's taking six years to get to this point, but from a little known myopia management to what it is today, 
Yeah. We've definitely made inroads, you know, the International Agency of Prevention of Blindness know us, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, as well as the American Academy of Optometry, the World Council of Optometry. All these organisations are acknowledging that myopia is an issue. And because we're getting recognition at that level, it makes it a lot easier for practitioners around the world to say to their patients that myopia is an ocular health issue and that's the start. But at the end of the day, it is the practitioner or the right. eye care practitioner at the front line that is in the trenches and you know they are the soldiers that we rely on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we have to have the science for many of us to fully get on board. And, uh, you know, we, we so often have our clinical experience uh, following, unfortunately, maybe further than we want it to where the science is. So 2019 was a big year because the IMI first kind of white papers came out. And uh, tell us about that big project back then. Um, and uh, how did that all come about? And can you tell us a little bit about the 2019 papers? Absolutely. Like you said, the evidence is what's most critical. Right. Because all of eye care practitioners, you, myself, we're all about the patients. We're not going to be offering something that there's no evidence for because at the heart of it, we care about what we do in our patients. And so the IMI has always been focused on evidence first. Yeah. And it's not about products because we don't mention products. Products are something that have come after to support the needs of the practitioner and what supports the science. So the so the white papers came about because we recognized that, you know, there's thousands and thousands of papers published over time. And truthfully, practitioners are so busy, they're not going to really be able to read all the papers or even sort through what are the most important papers. And then some parts of the world, they can't even access papers because journals are not necessarily freely available. Yes. And so you have some parts of the world where they're still reading um, literature that's from 20 years ago, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And so we recognise the need that we need to actually bring all the evidence together and put it in a form where every, anyone can access it, yeah. read it and understand it. So that's how the task forces were set up to look at the initial seven different topics. So we started small because IMI was really just a very small group of experts at the time. And, you know, we're not a big organisation with millions and millions in marketing. So we really just focused on what's critical, the critical topics of need that people need to know about, such as a set of definitions or recommendations mm -hmm. on myopia first. Right. And, and, and to interject there, you know, I think many of us have a pretty well understanding of what myopia is. But I think you pointed out in, in the papers, the definition of myopia is all over the board, right? I mean, there were yeah. so many definitions out there. Even even though I was working in the area, I didn't realize there were over 400 definitions on myopia. <laughs> you know, I always just thought myopia was minus 0 0.50 adopted or worse. Yeah. But, you know, in the literature, some people are saying it could be minus 0.75 adopters or worse. Um, and then, you know, you have that terminology spherical equivalent, which is like, you know, the refractive error plus half the seal. And then even high myopia was all over the place. You know, right. some people are saying minus six diopters or worse or equal to minus so, six yep. diopters or worse, minus five diopters or even minus eight diopters. Mm -hmm. And then pathologic myopia, there was confusion about that too because some people say pathologic myopia is is only when you show pathology in the retina mm -hmm. and that can happen at any level or it could happen at minus eight diopters. So we set about to standardise it because yeah. without a standardised definition, how can we all be speaking about the same problem? How can we be managing it in a systematic way? And I think for us to manage our patients better, we have to have a systematic standardised protocol mm -hmm. um, so that we can ensure that all our patients are sort of getting you know, the maximum benefits from any kinds of treatments. Yeah. So beyond oh. definition, what were some of the other topics initially covered in 2019? Yeah. Oh, I should say that one new definition sure. that came out was the pre one, but we'll talk about that later. That's right. Yeah. Um, the other topics were interventions, and yeah. that's because in that space there's been so many things, child-like progressive additional lenses, bifocal spectacles, um peripheral hyperopia reduction lenses at the time and then you know a multitude of 
multifocal type contact lenses, center distance, peripheral plus, um, EDOF, and then ortho K. So, you know, it is confusing for the practitioner as to what they should expect in terms of average slowing for the patient, what is the best modality. And then there was all the various concentrations of atropine at that time in 2019. Yeah. You know, people were using 0.5, 1%. Um, 0.01%. And then there was the question about rebound effect. So all those things needed to be answered and made clear. Mm -hmm. And other topics that we looked at included industry guidelines and ethical considerations. So that kind of went into, you know, if it's off label, are we ethically able to use it and treat it? Um, you know, how do we talk about informed risk to patients? And then there was clinical management guidelines, which set out, you know, the review um, of your patients, um, whether or not you should be doing cycloplegic refraction, accommodation right. and BV, mm -hmm. for example. And, um, yeah, there were seven. There's so many in it. This kind <laughs> of escapes yeah, you, me you, for the you, moment. You, you did very good. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I know they're very close to your heart. So the, the interesting thing is that this work isn't just something that a bunch of researchers got together and came together. This is something that is now being so well recognized that even as of this morning, the date of our recording, it was announced that you have uh, a, a new industry supporter that is coming through. So it's as as time goes along, this work is becoming more impactful. And you know, I'm just so excited to see these different companies that are jumping on to support the, the current and future work that you're doing. That is that is really, really, uh, I think, a testimony to the to the great work that you have done. Yeah, it's uh, really it's really heartwarming to see because, as I said, we're a small organisation and we don't necessarily have people who spend their time fundraising. Right. And so a lot of these times, um, you know, we had we had our sponsors with us from the start, like Cooper mm -hmm. Vision, Zeiss sure. and Alcon and Vision Impact Institute, who, who started with us when we yeah. were essentially just a really small group of people right. producing very very limited content, I should say. Yeah. And yeah. as time's progressing, other groups are coming to us and saying, we want to work with you because we see the need to share this evidence further. And, and the thing is, these sponsors are great because they literally just say, we want to fund your activities, but we're going to be hands off. We don't yeah. expect you to be marketing our products or anything. Yeah. And I think it shows that they've got a big vision and they're also going in the right direction about what myopia management should be. It should mm -hmm. be about the patient, the evidence and providing um, management options that actually work and are accessible yeah. to patients. Yeah. So my mantra is that always do what's in the best interest of the patient. That'll be in the best interest of your practice. And that'll be in the best interest of our industry, right? Yeah. And so when our industry sees that, is that they're supporting the research, which supports the practice, which supports the patient, it's going to it's gonna all come back to them. So 2019 wasn't the end, though. We're in 2021, and you've released this year additional papers. And I was at first kind of like, well, that's, you know, that's that's pretty quick. And you know, I, I've been my, managing myopia for 15 years. And you know, I have my finger in the literature and, and, and then I was blown away that over a thousand papers have been published since 2019 on myopia. And how in the world am I supposed to have a pulse on anything that's happening? So you released additional papers this year. What, what are some of the things that, uh, that you see as the highlights of the newer papers, 2021 papers? Yep. So so we did the yearly digest. A thousand papers, yeah. Monica. A thousand. It's just incredible. Yeah, it's really hard to keep up. So like the way I keep up is I have all these alerts coming to me like 24 hours a day on, on <laughs> new publications. <laughs> and I can't expect other people to do that because you're busy running a practice, you're managing your right. patients, right? right. Yeah. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an assistant professor, so I have a bit of time to read these things. But you know, I recognise the need with the rest of the task force members that we actually have to go and pick the ones that are most critical that practitioners need to know about. Yeah. And so, you know, we were, we the task force chairs from 2019 came back together to pick the most, um, in their opinion and their task force opinion, the most critical papers. So, you know, in, in definitions, it was about, you know, new axial lengths coming out and mm. and the fact that people are still using a variable number of definitions for myopia and homopia, which makes it sometimes difficult to compare studies. So we've got work to do to try to, yeah. you know, make that standardised. And then we had the animal model study uh, group 
and they they've talked about new treatments that are now being trialed in um, myopia models, animal myopia models, and some are now going into safety testing in human beings. So that includes uh, caffeine eye drops, which uh, Professor L Smith led, and I also collaborated with. Um, that's actually going into safety testing in kids currently. And then there's a then bromonidine, all these IOP lowering type drugs that may also additionally slow myopia in humans. We don't know yet because it's just been done in guinea pigs and chick models. And then we have the interventions, which which is fantastic in clinical management updates because you know since the last papers we've had, you know how the highly spherical lenslets published, um, you know new spectacle options, the defocus incorporated multi uh, multiple segments, right. another spectacle lens option um, that's shown good, uh, shown real promise in kids. And then we have, you know, additional information about the MySight lens three-year mm -hmm. results, three which years. show that they're fantastic, and 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 the FDA approval on those mm -hmm. means it's a real godsend to you know eye care practitioners to have an FDA approved treatment. Right. And then we have additional information like new studies on. Uh, one new study on ortho K and combined low dose atropine treatment that shows increased efficacy in Japanese children so far, early studies. So there's a lot of exciting new treatments that are coming through because this area, eye care practitioners are crying out for, you know, more options, um, you know, and we're seeing improvement in efficacy. And then we're seeing all these various low dose atropine treatments being trialed now, 0.025. 0.05%. And there are still other groups trialing 0.01% because the evidence still isn't so clear about how 0.01%, um, you know, how, how well mm -hmm. other ethnic groups respond because traditionally all the studies have been done in East Asian kids. Right. So there, right. there's updates in all these things. And yeah. then there's other areas of white papers which we didn't tackle in the first series that, you know, a lot of people feel they they are confused about or we need to advance the research in the area because there's not enough in that such as accommodation than the binocular vision mm -hmm. how does that relate to myopia development or progression mm -hmm. environmental risk factors so today the new recommendation for outdoors time is 120 minutes additional outdoors compared with what originally was 80 minutes yeah. and that's because in in you know uh, in Taiwan, they were finding that the 120 minutes was slowing, um, was actually reducing new cases and slowing my peer progression further. Yeah. So a lot of these things. What else? <laughs> I've been working on them all week. And yeah, math pathologic myopia. Right. And that's because there's the photographic classification and the new treatments on, on that aspect. Yeah, so those things. So I do recommend people have a read of them. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're really long, these white papers. Yeah. So realistically practitioners if you want to start somewhere you can go to the clinical summaries because i've tried to make the clinical summaries only maximum one page length to give you the most critical um findings yeah yeah i i, I love that um you got a group of people together large group of people together to summarize a large group of data into a document that was a very long document and then you made that document even shorter in the clinical summary. So it's a short and short and short version yeah. of everything. It's uh, it's incredible work. And Monica, where where should people go to find this information? Um, where, 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 where's the best place to look for this data? Um, so we've put it all together in the form of white papers and clinical summaries. Um, Soon we'll also have an infographic of yep. the most recent summaries to make Good. it even more simpler and accessible. So all of these are available for free download from our website, which yep. is www.myopiainstitute.org. And if people actually do want to keep up with information, they can sign up for a free general membership where they receive e-blasts about news, about, um, you know, any new resources that we put up, uh, updates as to which meetings we're going to. So we do like to reach out to eye care practitioners all around the world. So we we tend to go to the big meetings such as yeah. American Academy of Optometry in Boston. Mm -hmm. We're going to the Asia Pacific Association for Ophthalmology as well. And that's where we have the big symposiums which show yeah. the highlights of the white papers and give ECPs a chance to 
um, talk to us and ask us the questions they're interested in. But then we also uh, update our website with meetings where we have uh, certain uh, task force chairs or members speak at around the world. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, if you didn't catch that, it was a big deal. Monica promised free membership for all listeners of the Myopia podcast. Uh, or if you're not a listener of the podcast, you can get it too, right? But so, so free mm -hmm. subscription to all of this information. And, you know, you've also put on these symposium. I've seen some of those that are, you know, recorded and, and symposiums that have been done at places like the Academy a couple of years ago. We missed last year, but those are incredible, uh, incredible uh you know, meetings for uh, us to hear more about what's going on, those clinical summaries. I think the infographic idea is going to be brilliant. I think many of us are going to be able to take a lot away from that. So, but I would uh, certainly encourage everybody to check out the clinical summaries. And uh, thank you so much for your work, Monica. It's just incredible to have a, a resource like this culminating all of the research. It's something that I use. It's something that I have my residents use. And it's just a, a wealth of information. So thank you for what you do. Thank you very much. Yes. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Make sure to stay tuned for additional episodes. Like and subscribe so that you can get notifications. And uh, stay attuned to all the greatest information on myopia. Thank you again for joining the Myopia Podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.